Well, the purpose of God's judgment, we're going to divide it into three parts in chapter 22, where we're looking at now, is the consuming of God's wrath. But we're going to also look in the next couple of studies together, in chapter 23, we're going to examine the corruption of God's people, which led to this terrible disaster. And finally, in chapter 24, the conquest of Jerusalem by Babylon will be discussed. Then in chapter 25, he moves to the nations that surround Judah and Jerusalem, Israel's enemies. So if you have your Bible, follow along, please, as I read chapter 22 of Ezekiel and verses 1 to 31. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Now thou, son of man, wilt thou judge, wilt thou judge the bloody city? It's incredible how God would say that. Yet thou shalt show her all her abominations. Then say thou, Thus saith the Lord God, The city sheddeth blood in the midst of it, that her time may come, and maketh idols against herself to defile herself. Thou art become guilty in thy blood that thou hast shed, and hast defiled thyself in thine idols which thou hast made, and thou hast caused thy days to draw near, and art come even unto thy years. Therefore have I made thee a reproach unto the heathen, and a mocking to all countries. Those that be near and those that be far from thee shall mock thee, which art infamous and much vexed. Behold, the princes of Israel, every one, were in thee to their power to shed blood. In thee have they set light by father and mother. In the midst of thee have they dwelt, have they dealt by oppression with a stranger. In thee have they vexed the fatherless and the widow. Thou hast despised mine holy things and hast profaned my Shabbats. In thee, O men that carry tales to shed blood, and in thee they eat upon the mountains, in the midst of thee they commit lewdness. In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness, in thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. And one hath committed abomination with his neighbor's wife, and another hath lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law, and another in thee hath humbled his sister, his father's daughter, in thee have they taken gifts to shed blood. Thou hast taken usury and increase. Thou hast greedily gained of thy neighbors by extortion. Hast forgotten me, saith the Lord God. Behold, therefore I have smitten my hand at thy dishonest gain which thou hast made, and at thy blood which hath been in the midst of thee. Can thine heart endure, or can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it, and will do it. And I will scatter thee among the heathen, and disperse thee in the countries, and will consume thy filthiness out of thee. And thou shalt take thine inheritance in thyself in the sight of the heathen, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross, all they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you are all become dross or dross, behold, therefore I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace, to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury. And I will leave you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst thereof as silver is melted in the midst of the furnace. So shall ye be melted in the midst thereof, and ye shall know. That phrase that appears 70 times in Ezekiel, ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. 
Her priests have violated my law, have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean, and have hid their eyes from my Shabbats, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have dubbed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they've oppressed the stranger wrongfully, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Watching a little bit of the news of the Democratic National Convention, I thought to myself, I wonder how they would respond if we read Ezekiel 22 to them. Let's pray. Father, we know that you are a God of holiness and righteousness and justice. It's a part of who you are that we kind of run away from or at least ignore. We are attracted by your love and grace and mercy and your wonderful forgiveness. But you are not a God who sweeps our sins under the rug without our confession and repentance. We've already read how you appeal to your people to repent and to turn from their wicked ways. But their rebellion kept them going on thinking that they would never be destroyed by God. And we have come again to a culture even that calls itself often a Christian one, though secularism dominates us more than we want to admit. This land, which was founded on Christian principles, has turned its back on you, Lord. And we cannot help but connect what we read happened 2,500 years ago with what is happening now. And God, help us not to point the finger, but to recognize our responsibility before God to get right with you before it's too late. I thank you, Lord. We commit ourselves to you and your word. In the precious name of our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. The consuming of God's wrath is a terrible thing. Now, for those of you who are taking notes, let's start in the opening 12 verses with the description of why God will bring his wrath upon them. We're only going to have two major points because in the second one, well, make it three. We're also going to deal with the disaster that God will bring. He tells them what he's going to do. And, of course, they didn't believe it. If uh, we analyzed our own culture in the light of what happened when God judged his people, Israel, a people that he uh, had a covenant with, uh, a people that he said, I'll never forsake you, a people that he said, I've engraved you in the palms of my hands. If he said it all to Israel and yet judged them, what makes us think we're going to escape the judgment of God? How did we ever come to that conclusion? We need to wake up the description of why God will bring his wrath upon them is in the first 12 verses. And to begin with, you have a problem here about shedding blood. I want to just answer it for you right off the bat so we identify with the passage. The issue of shedding blood is both literal and figurative in this section. Let me start with literal. Literally, King Manasseh, according to 2 Kings 21, had shed innocent blood and according to the Bible, literally filled Jerusalem with that blood from one end to another of that city. Well, what did he do? He offered babies and sacrifice to pagan gods. 
performed enforced abortions upon people. Sound familiar? As a matter of fact, God said that that's a reason that his judgment would fall, even though following that, there was a revival under good King Josiah called the boy king because of his age. But in 2 Kings 23, verse 26 to 27, we learn that God's judgment still is going to fall upon Jerusalem for what happened under Manasseh. Hey, it went on with other kings, but it got worse under Manasseh as he offered these precious babies to the god Molech, burned them alive on the iron brazen arms of Molech with the fires burning them as they listened to their screams and believed they were doing the right thing. The words blood and bloody are repeated seven times in this one paragraph, and they speak of two things. One is death, of course, but the other one we may miss. He's speaking of defilement also. So let me list for you in the opening description of the first 12 verses six reasons why God brought his wrath upon the people of Israel and upon Jerusalem. Number one, in verse five, one to five, her abominations made her a reproach to the heathen. That's quite a statement. After all, the heathen were a reproach to Israel for all their abominations. Now Israel's doing the same. The word abomination as used in the Bible, and if you've read your Old Testament at all, you know that it appears frequently in the history of Israel. What is an abomination? Two things according to the Bible. One is idolatry, and two is sexual immorality. And the two of them went together. In the name of their pagan idolatry, they had much sexual immorality and the issues of blood become very significant. Abominations, that's what God called them. And abominations always deserve the judgment of God. It's interesting to me that the coming Antichrist, a coming world leader, the whole world will be going bonkers over. They will love the way he talks, they will love his promises, they will love his leadership, and yet the Bible calls him the abomination of desolation. He has no regard for women whatsoever. He'll abuse and use them as he wants. And the same thing throughout the history of Israel was called abominations. The second thing as to why God would bring his judgment is in verse 6 and 7, in that her abuses were tolerated by the leaders. Isn't that so? Is it not ever so in the history of the world that leaders tend to be corrupt? Much power, much corruption. And we read that again. The princes of Israel, these leaders, everyone had in their own power to shed blood and they set light by father and mother. In other words, they didn't pay any attention to what their parents said. And they dealt by oppression and the stranger, they vexed the fatherless, and the widow. Constant abuse of people who were definitely in the helpless category. The third thing that God said would cause him to judge them is in verse 8 and 9, and that's the attitudes toward worship and God's authority. It deserved God's rebuke and judgment. Verse 8, you have despised my holy things, Hey, I don't need to insult your intelligence. We got a whole culture doing it. Despising means to look down on it like it's no longer significant or important. You profane my Shabbats. I told you what to do. I want you to honor me. You, you don't do it. You carry tales to shed blood. You, you eat upon the mountains. That's talking about pagan shrines on the high places. And in the midst of thee, they commit what? Lewdness. The old King James boys could hardly believe what they were reading there because it is the most wicked, defiled, awful sexual sins ever described. And so they simply put one word they thought covered it all, lewdness. We have a society that is heading the same way. 
and has been for a long time. 62 million Americans, they tell us, are subscribers on a regular basis to pornographic literature. Over 40 million of those 62 are subscribers to what they call hardcore that involves mutilation and death of those that are abused. All this goes on behind the scenes. Well, maybe it used to be behind the scenes, but it's more out there now than ever. And we don't deserve the judgment of God. Which brings me to verse 10 and 11. The fourth thing as to why God brought that judgment was her sexual activities were violating God's commands. It says so. They, it says they discovered their father's nakedness. That means they had sex with their mother. Uh, this is a statement that is uh, perhaps one of the ways old King James boys covered up uh, the wickedness that was being described in God's law. We talked about discovering the nakedness of somebody. Well, it's a lot more than just being nude in front of them, I'll tell you that. The fact is, it was really wicked. He mentioned some. You humbled her. Uh, you, you committed abomination with your neighbor's wife. You lewdly defiled your daughter-in-law. You humbled your sister, your father's daughter, your aunt. It's amazing. If you, if you want to read why any nation deserves judgment, then read what God said in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. I don't know how many you'd count. I counted at least 15 different sexual practices that deserve God's judgment. Many of them deserve the death penalty. People laugh at that and say, well, how cruel. I don't know. Maybe it was an act of mercy to protect everybody else. The reason I say that is Israel was guilty of a lot of a simulation of pagans around them, and I did have some experience personally with what they found in Egypt. Uh, in the mummies that were uncovered, and there's a gigantic room in Cairo Museum uh, where you can look at all the mummies who are identified uh, in these glass cases, and the number one thing they discovered was sexual disease. The average age of these pharaohs, remarkably low. Very few lived to be 35 or 40. And the wickedness that went on, the sexual disease that went on. Israel was experiencing the same thing. They were absorbing into their own culture what pagan nations were doing. Like somehow God doesn't really know what freedom is all about. Their view of freedom was to do whatever we want to do when we want to do it. It had no law connected to it. And God came along through Moses and gave specifics. What is wrong and what deserves the judgment of God? And a lot of people say, boy, I'm thankful we don't live then. Well, are we also thankful for the spread of 128 sexual diseases in our culture alone, eight of which are at epidemic levels, with no cure in sight? One writer says, America is going to die physically before it understands how to live spiritually. There's a lot of truth to that. It's like the hidden truth. We can't tell parents. Doctors have to keep the information private. And on and on it goes. I've been out in Central Africa. I'm aware of what sexual diseases and abuses can do to a culture it, that culture is being destroyed, being destroyed by practices that violate the laws of God. And God says, I've had enough. When my people start doing it, we expect that of the pagans and of the heathen around us. But when God's people keep doing it, they deserve God's judgment. Judgment must begin at the house of God. The fifth thing is in verse 12, and that is her avarice. You might call it by the word greed, but avarice revealed they cared little about the suffering of people. They talk so piously about their new programs that will care for the poor and downtrodden, and yet very little is ever given. Very little care is ever there. They have taken usury, that's interest and increase. God told his people, never charge any of the poor among you any interest when you loan them money. 
Now, with the world about you, yeah, you can charge interest, but not among God's people. God considers that abuse of the worst sort. And yet we have Christians doing it all over the place. Like it's okay? No, it's not okay. It's a part of the abuse that goes on in the financial area. We need to wake up. God meant what he said. In the last part of verse 12, you have the sixth and most important one of all, her apathy toward God himself. It says, you have forgotten me, saith the Lord God. There is right now legislation being promoted by the Islamic Council here in America to remove every statement whatsoever that refers to Christianity or its God out of American life. What's happening to us? And the fact that our leaders that we vote for are listening to this? It's amazing what has happened. We keep asking, you know, would God judge America? Of course he would. The evidence is the first 24 chapters of Ezekiel. Let's go to a second matter in verses 13 to 22, and that's the disaster that God will bring upon them because of it. And it was a shock to people who thought, God will never destroy Jerusalem. It's under the protection of God. Well, let's just take a look at what he says he will do in verses 13 to 22. And if you're watching your notes, uh, we're going to deal with a number of things. First, he will smite them for what they have done. Verse 13 and 14. He says, therefore I have smitten my hand at thy dishonest gain which thou hast made and at thy blood which hath been in the midst of thee the blood of babies who were offered in pagan sacrifices to pagan gods. Can thine heart endure? Can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Never forget that God is God. He's not man. Secondly, he will scatter them among the nations, verse 15 and 16. He has done that. I'll scatter thee among the heathen, disperse thee in the countries, will consume thy filthiness out of thee, and thou shalt take thine inheritance in thyself in the sight of the heathen, and thou shalt know that I'm the Lord. You know how we really know that God is God? By the judgment he brings for our wickedness. Isn't that interesting? Oh, we'd rather know him in another way, but if we continue in our rebellion against God, even personally, if you're doing something you ought not to do and God said it's sin and you keep doing it, King David said if you regard or entertain iniquity even in your heart, the Lord won't hear you. But if you keep it up and you start doing this stuff, you are facing the judgment of God. It may come in many ways, in the trouble in the family, in the financial areas of life. It may come in your health, but God is going to bring his judgment. And a nation that decides they don't need to follow the rules of God, they are going to experience judgment. If it weren't for God's mercy and grace and forgiveness, frankly, I have no hope for our culture. I pray that God will be merciful to all of us. And number three in verses 17 to 22, in a lengthy section, he will strike them with the fire of his wrath. Now, was that literal? Yes, it was. They were shocked that Jerusalem was burned. You can read the tragedy of Lamentations as the Jewish people said, is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? Look at what happened. We are devastated. Can you not see the, the ravages of the fire of Babylon? Yes, it was literal, but it also is referring to God putting them in the furnace, as it were, of his wrath those that had some treasure before him are now going to be purified in his furnace. When I looked at verses 17 to 22, I, I saw 
two things that I thought were important. One, in verses 17 and 19, they have lost their value. They have lost their value. Verse 18 is one of the most tragic verses in the entire Bible. It says, the house of Israel is to me become dross. That's all you are. Because of all you have done. It's incredible. And the second thing I notice is they will be left in God's furnace. According to verse 20 and 22, they're not going to escape. It will not be light The fire is going to be devastating. It will melt you. It will blow upon you. They tell us over a million people have died. We don't know for sure. But God's going to leave them there. And why? Verse 22. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. The world does not want to listen to a God of fury and judgment. But I tell you all, The greatest event to happen to planet Earth is still in our immediate future. It's called the day of God's wrath and vengeance on planet Earth. The Bible teaches it will culminate with God burning up the entire planet. I think we need to reevaluate our understanding of who God is in a day when so many people in our culture, including those in high places, have departed from the Lord. They no longer care about Him. Which brings me to the third section here from verse 23 to 31, and that's the deception of their leaders is what brought the wrath of God. I want you to see seven things here that I hope will be an insight to all of us. Leaders bear great responsibility. To whom much is given, much is required. I was reading some past literature out of the uh, Puritan era in early America. It was interesting. They thought they were going to experience the day of the Lord because of the wickedness in colonial America. It was interesting to me to read it. And God sent along men like John Wesley and George Whitfield. Uh, he sent men who physically were, were difficult to listen to and had to sit down to preach, like Jonathan Edwards, first president of Princeton, who spoke about sinners in the hands of an angry God and set the fire of revival off in that little group of people that swept all across New England. And I looked at all of that, and I was thinking of leadership. I was thinking of leaders in the church of Jesus Christ today who are trying to come up with every cute little plan and program they can to adapt to a culture that's far removed from God, all in the name of reaching them yet in the process undermining the very word of God which they were responsible for. It didn't matter whether it was purpose-driven or whether it was emerging church or what it was. The fact is we have a colossal turning away from the word of God in our culture. We better wake up. And I thought about it as I was putting this message together. You know, God's holding me accountable for telling you the truth that's found in God's word. And I read so many commentators, uh, commentaries, especially now since I'm teaching Ezekiel, that they jump all over this stuff. They just sweep on by it. They don't want to tell audiences what this says. And I understand that. I I think I'd rather tickle your ears and make you really excited and, and wonderful and everything's going to be better than it's ever been and you too can be rich and healthy and Excuse me, I can't do it. It's impossible. I made a commitment to teach God's Word. The Bible says in the end time, there will be a famine for the Word of God. We'll be going to and fro to find someone to teach us what the Bible actually says. And yet we're going to church after church that is entertaining us. 
my wife and I were watching uh, on uh, Christian television um, some singers, and they're very good. And I felt like throwing up. I'm listening to this very good singers and watch the carnality that was going on. And I thought to myself, what's happened to us? Where's the holiness of God? Where are the teachers who will tell us the truth? That if we don't repent, we are going to face the judgment of God. Where are the teachers that are warning us that the majority of believers when Jesus comes are not really believers, says the Bible. They say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done wonderful works in your name? Haven't we preached in your name? Haven't we cast out demons in your name? And what will he say? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. He's going to say it to the ones who thought they were true believers. This isn't something to mess around with or play church. We're in trouble, people. We're in real trouble. And all of us need to search our hearts and do what Paul said. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. Do not treat lightly the grace of God or presume upon it that somehow you can get away with murder in your personal life and say all kinds of evil things and do all kinds of wickedness and somehow get away with it because of God's grace and forgiveness. Paul condemns that in no uncertain language in Romans chapter 3. So, what about these leaders? Leaders are responsible to inform those who follow what God has to say. No more, no less. What are these seven things? Number one, the cleansing they needed was not done. How could you be any more simple than that? Verse 21, uh, 24, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rain upon in the day of indignation. God withdrew his agricultural blessing because of it, but they didn't see it as coming from the Lord. I wondered about that. As we were in Israel and just got back, they're having a serious drought and they're very concerned about water, and well, they should be. And I just happened to say in passing to our guides that were referring to it, I said, well, maybe this is a sign that we need to pray and get right with the Lord. They both looked at me and said, well, there, there can be other reasons. And they start talking about how it hasn't snowed much on Mount Hermon. I didn't know what to say, so I said, well, According to Psalm 148, God's in charge of that. So apparently he's not bringing a whole lot of snow lately. The question would be, why? They said, well, what are you saying? I said, you mean it's not that clear? <laughs> I'm saying that maybe the drought in Israel is a call, a warning, a gracious kindness from God to say to his people, you need to get right with me before this gets worse. Number two, verse 25, the conspiracy of her prophets was spreading, exactly like we have in our country. There's a conspiracy, like a roaring lion, ravening the prey. They devour souls. That's what's wrong. They've taken the treasure and precious things. Yeah, you send $1,000 and God will bless you. They've made her many widows in the midst thereof. And God sees it all. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Number three, in verse 26, the corruption of the priests defiled her worship. That's going on also. On the internet right now, there is a deep analysis, thorough analysis of the fake revival that's been going on the last few months in Florida. I wish we didn't have to look at it, but it's like on everybody's website. It's everywhere. 
And somebody needed to say something. It was false from the beginning. And people would criticize those who criticized it. And now they know it's the truth. The guy leading it was corrupt and defiled the worship of God. Corrupt morally. Corrupt financially. His lifestyle was wicked. He's been exposed. Looks like he's going to prison. Unbelievable. Is that going on in our culture? You bet it is. Why can't pastors live like the people they serve? People say, well, they deserve more. I doubt that, seriously. I used to tell the guys I trained for the ministry, you ought to thank God that anybody comes out on Sunday morning and wastes an hour of their time listening to you yell at them. I remember the first time after I started a church, after about a year, we had no money. Carol remembers it. We had no money at all, and they voted to pay me 25 bucks a month. I didn't know whether to cry or say, praise the Lord. I thought 25 isn't going to get us through a couple of days, much less a month. Went on like that for a couple of years. But God managed in his wonderful ways to make us contented. What's going on when video hyper-entertainment programs come by your house and say, is this all you got? That's happened to me. How many other homes do you have? This is all you got? 1,100 square foot condo? I said to them when I still tell people, hey, it's great. It's really great. I don't have to chase my wife. You go from one room to the other. That's all there is. Amen? Where's the amen? amen. Yeah, watch out in your multi-roomed house. I'm not telling you to be poor for poor's sake and have that false humility that's so sickening. Uh-uh. God's not against you being rich. God's against you trusting in it. They that want to be rich fall into many harmful desires and plunge men into many foolish and what? Hurtful lusts. That's what it says. And these men were doing the same thing back in ancient Israel. And number four in verse 27, the conduct of the princes was destroying the people. Verse 27, her princes are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls. Why? To get dishonest gain. Is that why you're in the ministry? Is that why you decided to be a leader? Because of the money? God help us. Verse 28, number five, the council of the prophets was filled with lies. That's the next thing that happens. Her prophets, you know, I made a list of some of the key television personalities. Now, don't ask me for it because I will not give it to you. I, I think the wisdom of the Lord caused me to not do it. But I needed to see it for myself, so I made a list of prophecies that I heard them say, either in person on television or that they wrote in books. I did it for, I, I don't know how long, it was almost a week, and it made me sick inside. Do you know how often that is done? It's like every day someone makes some sort of prediction. And what does the Bible say? If, it, if they aren't 100% accurate, they are false prophets. And what do we read here? Her prophets dubbed them with untempered mortar. They just put junk on it. Seeing vanity, the word is emptiness. There wasn't anything there. They said, the word of the Lord spoke to me. No, he didn't. God says over and over again in Ezekiel, I didn't speak to them. They divine lies. They say, thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hath not spoken. Is it being critical to ask somebody who says he knows what's going to happen, to ask him, what verse, please, teaches that in its context? What is the matter with us? 
We've let this entertainment-prone leadership in the church of Jesus Christ tell us what they think is going to happen without biblical proof. And we can sit here and be so pious and hypocritical about, oh, those people were sure terrible back there in Ezekiel's day, weren't they? It's the same today. And number six, verse 29, he's already mentioned, he does it again, the care for the needy was gone. The people of the land have used oppression, exercised robbery, vexed the poor and needy. They've oppressed the stranger wrongfully. If you want a real eye-opener to how God thinks, take your Bible sometime and just study what he said about the poor and needy. All the way through the Old Testament, even into the New and to shut up our hearts towards somebody who's really in need when we have the ability to help and we do not do it is experiencing in the Bible some of the worst, most unbelievable judgments that God has ever put on a people. God cares about the poor and needy, and so should we. And number seven, and finally, You asked me what was wrong in the leader's life. In verse 30 and 31, the call for someone to stand in the gap fell on deaf ears. Can you hear the heart of God here? Can you? As he said, I sought for a man who would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it but I found none, not one person. What a statement. Therefore, I poured out mine indignation. I've consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. My dear friends, our Christian culture right now has shown that we deserve the judgment of God. From the smallest to the largest church, the principles by which it is run and operate, operated are far from what God taught in his word. And God's people need to say enough is enough. We need to stand up and be counted. We need to stop compromising and tolerating evil in our midst, no matter what it is. I thought about it. (laughs) I'm watching the convention, this political convention, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I really needed sleep. I just got back from Israel, and that dumb thing is on. You know, I'm trying to go to sleep watching it, but I'm getting madder by the moment. You know what this is? This is a gigantic cover-up of a lot of wicked people. Do you know that? That's all it is, speaking so positively about people who ought to be in jail. It's unbelievable. But is the church different? No, the church is not different. That's why God said under Peter's advice, as he quoted what God's will was in this matter and said, judgment must begin at the house of God. Maybe we're running away from it in our own hearts. I was interested while I was in Israel at all the conversations I heard from Israelis about corruption. And they brought up the name of a military man whom I know, and they said, we need more like him. And I turned to him and I said, what does that mean? I wanted to hear what they had to say. They said, well, he has a salary like most of us, and he has a little one-room apartment with a bathroom attached. I said, well, that's interesting. Tell me more. Well, they think he's crazy, but he actually believes the Bible. Oh, shock, oh, shock. Imagine that, somebody leading Israel who actually believes the Bible. 
And then they went on to talk about the corruption and the scandals and the awful. I thought I was in America hearing it all over again. It's back again. And, and we think we're 2,500 years removed from Ezekiel, therefore we don't have to pay attention to it? Are you kidding? God is the same God. And whether we're in Israel or we're in North America, we need to repent. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And you know and I know our land needs to be healed. Amen? Amen. May God help us. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we all want to get to those chapters about the glorious future you have promised. And it's hard to read all of this that was true of your people so many years ago. But you left it here as you have told us. It's all written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We're that generation and this was all written for our learning so that we would get right with you. Lord, I know there's no hope apart from your Messiah. You've called him the Redeemer over and over again. You said the Redeemer will come to Zion. It was the Redeemer who said, look unto me, all you ends of the earth, and be ye saved, for I am God, and there's none else. Help us, Lord. I pray that where you have put your spirit upon our hearts, you put your finger upon a problem, a, a burden, a need, a, a sinful practice, a wicked imagination, a, a po poor and unbelieving practice that we carry on daily. God, I pray that you'd give us the courage to confess our sin to you and to repent before it's too late. We thank you, Lord, for your grace that gives us what we don't deserve, for your wonderful mercy that's new every morning because your faithfulness is so great. Thank you, Lord. And it's in the name of our Messiah, our blessed Lord Yeshua, that we ask these things. Amen.